Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Let's sum up what we're going to learn today. Are you ready for a recession? Next, what are we going to learn today? Inflation rising just one-tenth of a percent in March and 5% from a year ago as Fed rate hikes take hold. We'll break that down. Plus, we'll get to many other top stories and try to figure out how to use them in your approach to investing. March CPI goes the Fed's way and the market's way. It's been a grind for the S&P 500 essentially since maybe mid-March. Where we're waiting for proof on inflation coming down or statements that the Fed is done raising interest rates or jobs numbers that are so good that we could say, hey, we're going to skate right by this recession because it looks like it's coming. Therefore, are you ready in your portfolio? I was ready with an overvalued stock market in the last two years after seeing a massive run up knowing that the Fed was raising interest rates. Yeah, I changed my strategy a little bit. And now I'm changing my strategy a little bit as we see what we're going to be or where we're going to be six months to a year from now. It's not a big change. Total CPI was up one-tenth of a percent month over month. Expectations were for three-tenths, following a four-tenths percent increase in February. Core CPI, which excludes food and energy, increased four-tenths of a percent. Service inflation was up three-tenths of a percent. Excluding shelter, services inflation was flat compared to one-tenth percent increase in February and up 6.1% year over year versus 6.9% in February. So on the total CPI, we're up 5% versus 6% in February. That's the smallest 12-month increase since May 2021. Key takeaway here is that the report is... The disinflation is seen in March. It's like the unicorn or the Kuber Chabra or whatever you want to say. We're starting to see the thing that we didn't expect to see, disinflation. Now, on a month-to-month basis, is that enough for the Fed in May to take off? another interest rate hike and just pause and reflect. Keep in mind, it takes nine good months to see interest rates build into the system. And we're now starting to see it right about here. So we're it's going to get more painful on lending. It's going to get more painful on borrowing. It's going to get more painful if people are speculative. But are we closer to the end than the beginning? Are we in that six-month time frame where Wall Street's early? Yep, that's already built in. Few things excite the stock market more than the idea of the Fed being done raising interest rates. I love that line. Later this morning, I'm going to be speaking with Patrick O'Hare from briefing.com. And I'm going to ask him about that. Few things excite the stock market more than the idea of the Fed being done raising interest rates. So let's take a quick look at the stock market today. Now that we're open and now that we got a friendly print on inflation, Keep in mind, we're going to get producer price indexes tomorrow, and Friday, we're going to get retail sales. All of them are important, but I think consumer probably first and foremost important. So we got a, I don't want to say a flying check mark on this one. That makes it sound a little too flip. But the markets are in rally mode today. All three markets are in the green. The NASDAQ, the Dow, and the S&P 500, as well as Russell 2000. Crude oil is sitting at $82 and a half, $82.50 a barrel. What's interesting to note about that is it's starting to rise again, which is a headwind, not a tailwind. Today's news on inflation is a tailwind. I'm not saying you have to have everything working together, but you kind of, it helps when things do fall into place. Who was on the A team who said, I love it when a plan falls into place? I know you're saying, did he just quote the A team? Yes. Um, What do we have? The NASDAQ. Oh, the Democratic National Committee announced Chicago is going to be the home of their 2024 convention. I bring that up because that's next year. We're in. We're heading into primary season. And something that, again, we're talking inflation. We're talking interest rates. We're talking recession. 
We're talking end of Fed rate hikes at some point in time, but we're also talking about moving into election cycle. We're also talking about, you know, not a balanced budget in the United States, but a budget deal needs to be put in place soon. Otherwise, it's going to cause stress to the stock market. Wall Street doesn't like stress. Have you ever been with a partner who the moment the heat index goes up one level, they start to like freak out? That's the Wall Street. On if we get, you know, further into the summer months and we still haven't figured out how we're going to fund our government going forward. And that could happen in large part because Donald Trump is at the center of Republicans and Democrats fighting with one another over things that we should expect our government to do. They're no longer doing because they're trying to take a stand behind one person. For or against. I know you're saying that's quick, fast analysis. I don't have 10 minutes on CNN to explain this stuff. What do we have? Yesterday was a slight negative day on the market. Felt like running on a treadmill. We have a lot of dueling economic visions. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said yesterday that the U.S. economy is obviously performing exceptionally well. And yet you had the IMF uh, predicting more weak weak global growth this year, giving their gloomiest five-year economic forecast since 1990. Look, we need the world to work. Not, we are the world. We are the children. We are the ones who make about our day. Yeah, we do kind of need the whole world to work if we want, again, all the pieces of the puzzle in front of us so we can figure out where to go and how to go. I'm preparing a buy, just so you know. I would say I have to be very careful what I say. This is my personal account. And um, there's a couple stocks that are uh, dysfunctional that I think have disconnected from some of their fundamentals. And I'm literally, not literally, I'm in the process right now of putting together a, a, a buy with some of the money that my mother left me from her inheritance. Now, again, I have retirement money, totally different way I'm investing that. I've got kids' college money, totally different way I'm investing that. I've got you know my long-term retirement, my emergency money, totally different way. So on speculative, I'm getting prepared to make a buy. I'll leave enough there that if I have to buy a second time, I w- I could. I like averaging into positions. President Biden flew to Belfast, Northern Ireland, yesterday on a trip that conveniently for a business news uh, station broadcast um, captures travel trends right now. Biden is going to hang out with some family members. So it's kind of leisure, business leisure. Um, I'm on holiday spring break. My children are. I'm not, but I'm traveling with them. United tacked on nearly 25 international routes to the summer schedule, including adding flights to Barcelona, Berlin and Naples. JetBlue announced a new route to Amsterdam from JFK. It'll begin in late summer. Croatia's. Paula Airport is even considering lengthening its runway to accommodate bigger planes that fly across the Atlantic. So get your passports ready. America is flying. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. Think about putting together an event for portfolio reviews and talking about money and investing with real estate and the stock market. Going to have a 500K minimum to sign up. It is going to be a meet and greet, much more so than a seminar, but it's going to end with a portfolio analysis, a snapshot, if you would. If you're interested in signing up, it'll be in Marin. It'll be in a month. Drop me an email, Rob at robblackshow.com. It's Rob at robblackshow.com. Brought to you by EP Wealth. This is the Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing and more, hoping and helping you craft a path to retirement. That's the goal. I want you to beat the markets if possible without taking on too much risk. A lot of people don't like downside. They're uncomfortable with it. So we have to try to steer you away from that. I don't want you to quit investing or quit your retirement plan because you think the game is rigged. It's not. If we take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average 30 chart for the last 80 years, 90 years, and you'll see it slowly, steadily goes up. There's no guarantee in that. But this market's gone through World War I. It's gone through World War II. It's gone through Korea, Vietnam, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, 
It's gone through presidents being assassinated. Reagan, Kennedy. It's gone through presidents being impeached, being driven out of office. It's gone through 150 oil. It's gone through oil that was being given away in the recent history of the United States due to lack of storage. Crazy. This market has seen everything. It's seen insulation. It's seen disinflation. I'm okay with it. If the market works with all those conditions, stop being the person who goes, I don't like it. It feels like a game. Well, it's because you're playing with like the wrong set of tools. So the SP 500, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the NASDAQ, the Russell, all moving higher today. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to be speaking with Patrick O'Hare from briefing.com. Egg and other grocery prices are starting to crack. See what I did there. See what I did there. An excellent. No, no, I'm not going to do it. Ham down 1.6%, pork chops down 1.4%, milk down 1.3%, peanut butter down 2.3%, instant coffee down 2.4%. You see where this is going? We're starting to see some disinflation. Something Wall Street very much so wants to see. The goal on the show is to get you to retirement. And I think one of the main thesis of the show should state something along the lines of Americans spend decades savings for retirement, but we're all different. Do you need 1 million or 2 million to retire? That's what I see most people aiming for. Speaking of nest eggs, excellent. 2 million is better than one. 1 million is better than less than a million. Majority of people have less than a million dollars. To benchmark your retirement plans, including savings and spending and how you spend your time, start looking at the numbers and how they stack up to other Americans. I'm not freaked out about retirement, but I have a lot of questions. So in my anxiety, I'm not prone to anxiety. I'm not one of those people. I'm not one of those people. Hey, can I buy my Xanax? I don't even take, like, I'm not allowed to take Xanax in this industry. Um, or no, no, not in this industry. <clears throat> when you have life insurance, it's probably a pretty good idea not to have large exposure um, when you're dealing with the financial world to things that could depress you and cause mood swings. If you've noticed one thing about me in the years, I'm pretty consistently boring. So thinking about retirement, First things first, when compared to other people, I think about retirement savings. Total household balances and retirement type accounts for those 65 years old and older, $407,581. Um, I have more than that. I feel good with that. 11.6% have balances of a million dollars or more. 5.7% have between $700,000 and $999,000. So that's where it falls. I'm not a baby boomer, but that's who I'm going to compare to first. And then I look at my own generation and they're around 300 to 400,000. So I, I, I check mark. I pass that one as far as future anxiety. How am I doing? I always want you to have 100 to $400,000 by the time you're 40 saved. Skew higher if you tend to spend more. Skew lower if you think you're going to cut costs in retirement. I don't know. I don't have all the answers for you. It's not meant to be that way. I still think you should have 10 to 20 times your salary. Someone got mad at me on that. But he's also going to be a lot more thrifty, and he's also going to expose himself to running out of money in his lifetime if things change. It could be inflation. It could be health. It could be many things that are very expensive. Social security benefits are, uh, benefits are where I go to number two to relieve my anxiety. Nearly 90% of Americans age 65 and older receive social security benefits as of the end of 2022 program allows people to start their retirement benefits anytime between 62 and 70. The average benefits $1,825 a month, but it could benefit. It can range this up to another 3,627 a month for someone retiring at full retirement age. That's a pretty big skill, but also I want to know where I'm at and I'm doing okay in my social security funding. I'm doing very well. I've had a lot of high peak earning years. So when I take a look at my social security statement by going to ssa.gov, 
I feel relief. So number one, I've got a big enough nest egg. Number two, I've got, I could, I know where I am with social security. Number three, health expenses. Um, I am a little bit on the, I'm never skinny. I'm never ideal weight. I'm always five to 10 pounds over ideal weight. Right now I'm probably 10 to 15. That doesn't bode well for my health care. Households headed by people 65 or older, they spend $7,030 on health care a year. Is that part of your budget? Because that's the average. That breaks down to $4,900 on health insurance, such as supplemental Medicare plans, $1,000 on medical services, including eye and dental care, $726 on drugs such as prescriptions, $253 on medical supplies. So the average is spending $7,000 a year. Okay. That's good. Now, what I think about, what if I need long-term care? I've seen some of my in-laws in that long-term care, ooh, how shall we say, parade of the march to death. It's not pretty when you're in memory care. And it's very expensive. I've seen some people basically run out of money and go to fundraising. In their last few years of health in decline, it becomes very, very expensive. couple other things that I, I do to feel good about where I am in my world of approaching retirement is I'm starting to lay down the groundwork for what I'm going to do and the activities. And I think it's going to be journalism focusing in on this show, but on a high school level, helping all the kids create some sort of voice, whether it be in finances or whatever they want, maybe their favorite music. Showing them how to put stuff together, how to report accurately. So I've started thinking about life in retirement. 30. One final thought for me is my net worth and how much will I have the day I pass on average? Um, how much do I want to leave to my kids? How do I want to leave it to my kids? Believe it or not, that's a stress for me. Leave them too much, leave them too little. Bill Gates says he's not, not going to leave a lot to his kids. And then he bought his kid a $50 million apartment. What? 10 part of stuff you have to think about. Where are you at in your thoughts on retirement? Find me online at robblackshow.com. What's the best way to choose a financial advisor? Download our guide at robblack.com. That's robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. We're waiting for Patrick O'Hare to call in. Stocks are rallying today after inflation data. Nothing to get really wildly excited about, in my opinion. The CPI report comes in cool. You know how Goldilocks deals with Wall Street? You don't want things too hot. You don't want things too cold. You want things just right. So it comes in cool. Let's ask Patrick O'Hare from briefing.com. Did Goldilocks stumble onto Wall Street this morning and, and find a nice inflationary number? Or what are you seeing, Mr. O'Hare? Hey, good morning, Rob. Um, you know, I think it was maybe um, a little bit of... of both, uh, okay. if you hear me out, so total sure. CPI was up 0.1 percent. Right, that was that was better than expected. Okay, and that brought the year-over-year -year rate down to five percent uh, versus six percent in February. So that's all good. Now, that total CPI number encompasses food and energy. When you take food and energy out of the equation, core CPI uh, was up 0.4 percent. Now that was as expected, but you saw the year-over-year -year increase. Uh, to 5.6% versus 5.5% in February. And so uh, I think when you take a step back, um, you know, a number that's in line with expectations should not elicit much of a rea reaction because there's no real surprise factor there. And the bottom line is even though total CPI was better than expected, the Fed focuses on core CPI. So I think that's why we're seeing, you know, the broader markets reaction, you know, right after the number was released, I think a lot of algorithmic trading kicked in just reading the, the news that, you know, total CPI was much improved. Um, but that's been dialed back here. And now we have a market that's kind of just, you know, sitting little changed at the moment, which in our eyes makes sense because the, the, the number that mattered most came in as expected. Is this enough for the Fed to pause? Is this enough to lead mm -hmm. to a change in policy? Is this enough to help the stock market say, okay, we're closer. Let's you know, put our feet in the water. Not necessarily go swimming with the sharks, but start to think about it. 
Is it enough? Yeah, that I mean, well, it's certainly the the market's hope, of course, that okay. uh, that that would be the case, and I think that's what was the knee jerk reaction you saw in the futures market after the release of the CPI data, as well as in the Treasury market. You know, where the two year note yield came screaming down, as uh, even more so than the ten year note yield, but. Um, you know, I think it, I think it does give the Fed enough room here. I think they're they're likely to still go ahead with that rate hike in May, based on what we know now. Um, but probably would be inclined to you know maybe pause and just give it a give some uh, breathing room there to see how uh, the uh, economy unfolds because we have seen other signs of softness emer- starting to emerge in other indicators. Um, you know, those ISM releases. We're not too spectacular. We've seen some deceleration in the pace of hiring. Um, the uh, pace of average hourly earnings has come down, um, and you know, and, and and so I think that you know, the market. Uh, well, obviously, we've had you know the banking issue, and and I think the Fed is cognizant of uh, the idea that banks are probably going to be more conservative with their balance sheets as we move forward here, certainly in the near term, and. So probably we'll go ahead and, and allow for uh, some breathing room after they go ahead and raise rates one more time. And I think we have seen or heard from, you know, several Fed officials who uh, who are I sound, seemingly sound okay with that idea. But I think the potential uh, I don't know, distraction may not be the right word, but the potential uh, stumbling point for the stock market in coming months is this idea that uh, you know the Fed funds futures market is pricing in a you know several rate cuts before the end of the year, and we have yet to hear any Fed official really kind of pivot to the idea of being open to cutting rates before the end of the year. The party line is predominantly, uh, yeah, we may go to five percent, you know, the rate hike here, and then hold for a while, but no one is talking rate cuts, and uh, and that's. Uh, something that has been accounted for in terms of where the stock market is trading at right now. So, uh, so we'll have to keep our eyes and ears open for um, you know for any comments from Fed officials that start to come around to the stock market's view, or conversely, you know, try to shoot it down. Uh, and that'll be a headwind for the stock market if they do. Sounds interesting. Let's move off of inflation and interest rates and maybe into earnings season. Are you, you've been a proponent? Let me make sure I'm using the right words. You've been not an advocate, but you, I guess, a proponent. You're hoping earnings expectations come down because the stock market has a high valuation. Um, there's kind of a teeter totter that, that goes on there. Can you talk a little bit about current valuations and do they stress you out? Not stress. No, no, no. Talk about current market valuations according to your job, maybe. Yeah. Sure, sure. Well, I should clarify. I'm, I'm not hoping earnings expectations come down. Right. I'm, I'm expecting them to. Um, and the, the reason for that is because of, you know, we have yet to see really, uh, you know, the, the lag effect of the Fed's prior rate hikes uh, hit home to any great degree. But it just, you, you know, just there's you can feel, feel it building. Right. I mean, the Fed's aim here, it wants to pretty much uh, well, kill or weaken demand, certainly. And it, and it will do that through the, through the labor market channel. And so, if, if, you know, fewer people are working. There's less spending, there's less growth, and, you know, and presumably that leads to, a, you know, a disinflation here. So the Fed is not intent here that it, you know, that it can, you know, raise the victory flag over inflation. I think the Fed is going to uh, raise again, uh, and I think they're going to stay, you know, put at higher levels here. And, and that will just, you know, it's going <clears> to <throat> cut into the disposable income, the discretionary um spending potential of consumers as we move forward in coming months. And as it does, that should bring estimates down. Now, uh, where we are now currently is we have a market trading at about 18.2 times forward 12-month earnings. Uh, That's a premium to the 10-year historical average of 17.3, according to FactSet. Now, that 18.2 is based on the estimates we see today and, you know, given what I just said and what we expect at briefing.com, you know, those estimates are apt to be revised lower here as we move through the first quarter earnings reporting period and maybe even, you know, as we continue into that second quarter earnings reporting period. So if you get a 10% cut to those estimates at today's prices, you have a market that is trading closer to 20 times forward 12-month earnings. And, 
And in our judgment, that's just uh, too much of a premium given what's going on with all the noise around us uh, as it relates to uh, not just the Fed having raised rates, but other central banks having raised rates and and us not yet really having seen any major cracks in the labor market to uh, um, uh, to account for you know what the Fed is trying to do and and uh, but we do think that that's likely to be coming and therefore we're not too excited about chasing the market here at these current price levels because we think that there's a cap at the moment uh, based on our theory that estimates are going to have to be revised lower and so um, so we are at the upper end of that nine-month trading range the S&P 500 has been in. And from our vantage point, we think it will be very challenging to break through that uh, with a fundamentally grounded argument uh, because earnings ultimately drive the market, and uh, we're not convinced that earnings are done going down. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. I'm thinking about putting a buyout on some stocks. Um, but the one thing that's stopping me personally right now is the valuation of the stock market. That's one of the things I wanted to ask you about. And again, we all approached investing differently. To me, I'm getting caught up on we're at the high end of a trading range on the SP 500. And that just turns me off a little bit. Is there anything that you're working on that you want to promote, talk through, um, give us a little insight on, so to speak, Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com? Well, you know, one thing I think we could probably uh, highlight, too, though, is that, you know, we, when I mentioned that the market is trading at 18.2 times, that's the market mm-hmm. cap weighted S&P 500. OK, right. you know, the, the equal weight S&P 500 is trading just over 15 times Ooh. over 12 month earnings. So what that suggests really is that you've got a lot of top heavy uh, valuation here um, where, you know, some of these. The bigger companies that have been leading the market higher here are, you know, kind of uh, pumping up that that valuation. So, you know, for investors looking to put money to work here, um, you know, over the long term, might want to consider an equal weight type of strategy. Um, you know, I don't make specific recommendations, but I would just draw people's attention. There's a, you know, Invesco has an equal weight ETF. The symbol is RSP. Um, you know, that is, you know, that's one avenue to try to, you know, approach the market here as opposed to buying into, uh, you know, the market cap weighted um, S&P 500. Um, so uh, I think that's an, an important dis- distinction to make. Um, sure. So, um, you know, that's why, you know, chasing it here as far as like just buying the spider, you know, the SPY, um, you know, that's where returns might be a little bit more challenging because we are already trading at a you know premium valuation uh, on that particular you know index that's really well said and thank you um and i'll add the color that you did not microsoft and apple have above average pe's thus making the market weighted sp500 a little bit more bloated strip them out and market weight everything and it looks a bit more appropriate. Thanks very much. It's Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com, a reliable source of domestic and international news that you can use in your portfolio. I start my day every day with his page one, and I end on Fridays with his big picture outlook. But briefing has so much more than just him. Um, it is a thorough uh, website that, that covers breaking news, economic calendars, earning calendars. Um, it, if I had to have one site, it's going to run pretty close with Bloomberg. The two work hand in hand in my mind. Top notch, world class information. Find me online at robblackshow.com. This interview featured on the Rob Black Show is brought to you by EP Wealth. Learn more at robblack.com. So 2022 wasn't in anyone's year the banner year that you wanted for stocks or bonds or real estate. Um, it just wasn't or for Bitcoin. We'll throw that one in as well. 2023 has turned out to be a different story, but we're still dealing with the effects of what happened in 2022 due to high inflation and higher interest rates. Causing a bit of an unraveling, if you will. Now we move, in my opinion, not yet. I'm not calling a victory against inflation yet. I'm starting to see it, though. It's not the light of their eyes. But I could feel that the British are coming step by step. They're getting closer to the point where they're going to break the Fed at some point is my thought. And if not, ooh, we're going down a new road. Coca-Cola's Fanta brand is releasing a limited edition fragrance. What? What? 
I don't like these kind of stories other than to say this has nothing to do with Wall Street. Maybe it does. But I'm going to say it doesn't. In the past, if you wanted to smell like Fanta, you had to open a soda, an orange soda, and pour it all over yourself. Now you can spray a Centennial. Where I would love to meet the couple who is turned on or attracted to the scent of Fanta. I guess there's some weird individual out there who qualifies. We'll find out on next week's edition of Dumb Things Going Through Rob's Mind. Um, Other things to talk about. I mentioned that as we're dealing with these inflation numbers and interest rate hikes, I feel we're moving towards not the set, maybe not the eighth inning, but like the seventh inning for sure. And the pitch clock's on, so everything's moving faster this year. The next thing we're going to have to deal with is earnings. Um, very much so. And if earnings are coming low, you're going to hear more about job cuts. Wall Street loves job cuts. That's a positive to me, not a negative. Tupperware. I know you're saying Tupperware. 77-year-old Ford storage icon? Yes, that Tupperware. They may have to shut down and tired buyers in a bid to seal its survivalist sales slump. Since the news hit last week, the stock has plunged nearly 50%. Through the 25 years of me doing this, I've seen Tupperware come and go. But the party looks like it's over. Last year, sales dropped 18%. The business ended the year with $700 million plus in debt. There is something to do with Wall Street that you should do if you practice individual investments. You should take a look on occasion of um, how much debt does the company have? Debt to equity, debt to sales, total debt, free cash flow FCF. These are all important to for a company to service debt. When you can't service debt and you bring up that bankrupt, And we're not going to share profits because you're bankrupt. Wall Street goes the other way and hides. Tupperware rose to fame in the 1950s with Tupperware parties, but it struggled to catch on with younger generations despite a distribution deal last year with Target. That seems like a good partner. But U.S. shoppers are concerned about plastic waste and more than 60% say that they'd pay more for substantially packaged products. Not substantially, sustainability of packaged products. Um, 84% of uh, customers surveyed were concerned with sustainable glass or metal options versus resealable plastic. Every piece of plastic ever made is still on the planet. Is that a true statement? What if you burn it? Tupperware is a name brand, but lots of shoppers equate its products with basically plastic, right? When you become ubiquitous in a category like Kleenex with tissue paper, Q-tips with cotton at the end of a piece of cardboard, Ziploc, plastic baggies with a seal at the top, those are all not those are all generic products, but with brand names. Coke or Nike always feel better, taste better than say an RC Cola, or a pair of shoes that are a knockoff of Nikes. So it's interesting when you see a brand go down. Walmart said that they're going to be putting a bunch of electric vehicle chargers into their stores, parking lots, thousands. This is interesting because as we get more electric vehicles, some people who are going to be winners are going to be people who provide us with chargers that when we go, and I, I don't like the current situation. When I go to a mall and I see some chargers, I'm like, ooh, let's go get the charger. Let's go get some free juice. And um, you, you find out that it's broken or that someone's been parked there all day. But would I go to Walmart for groceries versus Trader Joe's if it came down to electric vehicle charging station? Maybe Trader Jones parking, uh, Trader Joe's parking lots are tiny. What's up with the tiny parking lots? Um, every single one of them. I've never met one where you're like, ah, there's plenty of places to park. I'm not the biggest Trader Joe's fan. Just so you know, I know, I know. Controversy is, is just 
seeping from my mouth today. No. Um, but yeah, Walmart, it may be onto something in the future. You get enough electric vehicle chargers. You give people a reason to shop at your store. Credit reporting biggies, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion all plan to remove medical debt under $500 from credit reports. This move could clear nearly 70% of all medical debt in collections. Ford is going to invest $1.3 billion to transition an Ontario assembly plant into an EV hub to produce its next generation vehicles. It's all part of the automaker's plan to assemble 2 million EVs annually by 2026. The Writers Guild of America began voting yesterday to determine if it can call a strike on May 1st. If an agreement with studios isn't met, a strike could mean shorter TV scripted seasons, which would be a bump for reality TV, which would be a bump for broadcasters as reality TV is a lot cheaper to produce than TV scripted. 30. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Putting up a big new video at YouTube TV today uh, with an interview with me and EP Wells, Director of Portfolio Strategy, Adam Phillips. Check it out at YouTube channel Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. 